welcome to the Legislative Report. I'm Mindy Fee with the 37th District. And today we are at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area and we have Bert Myers joining us. So welcome, Bert. Thank you, yep. pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, tell us, we're out in Clay Township and we are in the Visitor Center right now mm -hmm. for the Wildlife Management Area. Tell us how this area came to be. How did it get started? Well, it started back in the 1960s with the Game Commission looking to provide additional waterfowl, specifically Canada goose hunting opportunities here in the eastern part of the state. So with a bond issue that was known as Project 70, the agency was able to get funding to start purchasing this land in the vicinity of what is now Middle Creek and then began development of the visitor center and also the construction of the lake, which included the spillway. So the visitor center was done in 1973 and we had water flowing over the spillway by the end of the 1960s. So that's why the locals call us the project. They're actually <laughs> referring to the bond issue and not the actual place. The project. How many acres are we? Currently Middle Creek consists of 6,254 acres. So we have a pretty good chunk of land here. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. it is a nice piece yep. of land. Yep. And on the land we have uh, the water out mm -hmm. front. Mm -hmm. Is there more or is, is that the only body of water? No, actually we have extensive wetland habitat here and that's really lends itself well to the waterfowl that we're trying to provide habitat for. So we have a 400 acre lake, we also have other 20 other ponds, impoundments, dike systems, all designed to provide water for ducks and geese. And that's been going on since the 70s. It has indeed, it has. So how do, I'm going to ask real simple questions, sure. okay? So we built this in the 70s, it wasn't mm -hmm. here, I assume it was just farmland before? Mm -hmm. That's correct. How do we attract? the wildlife or the animals or whatever it well, is Well, wildlife, we have. It's, well, you have four requirements, food, water, shelter, and space. And specific to waterfowl, they need water and they need area for food. So geese are grazers, they feed in our fields. So when you're visiting Middle Creek and you see the fields that are cut short, that's literally goose pasture. It is designed to feed geese. Okay. And then you'll see other um, of our meadows that are pretty tall and that provides nesting opportunity for ducks. It also provides really nice habitat for songbirds and a whole variety of wildlife. And we're not only known as the important bird area by the Audubon Society, but we're the only property in the state that's also an important mammal area. So the variety and diversity of wildlife is really here, no matter what time of year you visit. That was my next question. With the Game Commission, are there other areas like this throughout the state? No, we're pretty unique. The other wildlife management area that is uh, similar to Middle Creek would be Pimatuning, and that's way up near the Great Lakes near Erie. And that's a larger property that's been in the inventory longer, but uh, it's out of the way for most Pennsylvanians. We're right you know, here in Lancaster, Lebanon border. I was gonna say, we have a real treasure right here in we the do. 37th it's District. Right it's up wonderful. The road. Yep. So visitors come, and they're not just local people, obviously. Where, where do we attract visitors from? Well, the, the birding networks are pretty extensive, especially today in the internet. So we get birders from all over the country, literally. And we've been seeing um, tourists from Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, uh, New York City. It's amazing how far people travel to come visit Middle Creek, especially during the waterfowl migration. And, and what period of time is that? Well, I gotta stay general with you, Mindy, okay? Because it, it depends on weather, okay? This year we had a long winter and we were frozen and still most of our lake is covered with ice. So, so hold on now, I wanna interrupt. When they're frozen, the geese do not no come. No birds, right? Okay, that's right. no birds as long right. as we're frozen out yeah, there. Yeah, so they need open water to roost okay. in. That's where they're gonna spend the night. And they also need uh, snow-free fields so they can find food. So until those conditions were met, we really weren't seeing any other. Now on a normal winter, I start telling people, you know, end of February, early March is when you want to see the migration. We were at least two weeks later than that this year because of the extent of our uh, severe winter. As, so we were as last winter. Yeah. I mean, that was another both, bad These one. past sure. two years, both migrations have been a little bit later okay. and they seem to be quicker. The birds arrive and they're here for a shorter period and they're already pushing north. Tell me a little bit about this area. What, what is it, why, you know, what do people look for when they come here and what are they going to see? Well, the visitor center, we've gone through a series of upgrades the last couple of years. So actually in the room we're in now, all these exhibits are new and they really needed an update and we hadn't updated the exhibits since the place opened. So we are working on a second phase now. Visitors will come in here and see that some of the previous exhibits are no longer up. They're being either modified or having new exhibits uh, designed and, and fabricated. We're looking probably mid-May when that project is going to get 
start it and hopefully be done by the end of May. Okay. So uh, it'll be a busy spring because we have a lot of school groups coming here at this time of year. So with the, with the uh, exhibits directly, just give us one or two. Give a taste of what they'll see at okay. the exhibits. Uh, one of our popular exhibits is behind me that's showing the different nest structures we use for waterfowl. We have uh, boxes we put up for wood ducks. We have tubes that we use for mallard ducks. And then we have like a modified truck tire that is for Canada geese to nest in. So we have that exhibit shows those different structures that we use, and you'll see them out in the area. And then we also have a video on the importance and why we banned waterfowl as basically where the biology and all the natural history knowledge we have of waterfowl has really come from banding. Okay, can you explain that a little bit so people sure. understand that? Um, Normally here at Middle Creek, it's August and September is when we're banding ducks. And our primary species we're targeting are wood ducks and mallards because they breed here, mm -hmm. okay? So we have traps that are set up and our one exhibit shows what a trap looks like. It's basically a, 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 a box with garden fencing around it. We fashion an opening and then we begin baiting it. And when the birds go in to feed in the bait, mm -hmm. we've caught them, okay? So then with a net and we're gentle, we don't want to hurt That's them, we pull, we pull the birds and Every bird gets a unique metal band around their leg. And on that is a, a website for the Fish and Wildlife Service and also a unique number. Every bird banded gets a unique number. And then we're gonna write down the species. Is it a mallard, is it a wood duck? Uh, sex, drake or hen? And also age it, is it a juvenile or an adult bird? And then, How long does a bird live? Um, geese can be long lived. Geese can live into their 20s. 20 yes. years? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Hunters have harvested okay. banded geese that were 24 years old. Okay. Yeah, that one goes in the crock pot, by yeah. the way. That one's going to be tough. <laughs> but uh, then we release the birds. Uh -huh. And then, for example, when the snow geese are here, well, I'm in the field, I'm looking for some neck bands that'll be on some of the snow geese. And I've already reported four this year to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And they'll tell us exactly where that bird was banded. And I know where it's going to be. It's going to be way up in subarctic Canada, you know, around Nunavut, uh, Baffin Bay. Uh, Ellesmere Island because that's mm. that's their breeding grounds. That's where these snow geese are heading right now. Okay, okay. So I, one of the other things I know you do is you go out and you talk in the schools and yes. you bring students here. Yes. So let's go through some of those programs and not just for students but maybe okay. adult too education programs. What all is here? Well, good point. Um, as far as the schools go in this area, I'm doing just an amazing amount of programming every year. 7,000 or so students pass through Middle Creek in a school year to receive field trips, programming. Uh, we work with all those local school districts, but homeschool groups, private schools, colleges, Great. universities, Great. you know, from little guys all the way up to college students. Programming is available. I will have this caveat. We're popular. You got to call me early. If you call me in the spring, during the spring, I'm going to be booked, okay? But uh, we do a lot of extensive programming for students. Uh, I'm also involved in the Envirothons in Lebanon and Lancaster County. And uh, as far as public programming, we do have a pretty extensive schedule that can be accessed on the Game Commission webpage. And we have a lecture series that will be starting in April. There are Thursday nights at 7.30. They're all natural history or um, local interest kind of stories. Our first one's going to be in the history of Stony Creek and our game lands up near uh, Dauphin and there's a real history in there of uh, a community that a historian is going to pr uh, present on. Boy, that's great. We have a program that's going to be on the reestablishment of the river otter in Pennsylvania and throughout the world by Tom Surface who did the reintroduction. He's a professor at Frostburg State University now in Maryland. Okay. And all that can be accessed on our webpage. We also have the Wildfowl Show. I was going to then ask. We so have, people can find we, it on the webpage, oh yeah. and we'll put that up yep. so people can see what events are happening and what yep. lectures are happening. Yep. Okay. So we have the Wildfowl Show. We have an art show that's very popular, and also we celebrate National Hunting and Fishing Day at the end of September. And all of those are, going to, are up on our webpage now. How many people do you normally attract here? You know, we really don't have a good handle on that. I can tell you that during the March period when the snow geese are here, we get thousands and thousands of people here. Mm -hmm. Parking can be a premium, yeah. okay, but uh, you know, it's also a great place to stretch your legs because there's plenty of places not only to see wildlife and observe the waterfowl migration, but there's a lot of hiking trails here, good place to you know, get outside and stretch your legs. So you can hike, you can bike. You uh, great location for hiking. We have multiple trails here for every level from your little three and four year old the whole way up to the Horseshoe Trail passes through our property. The Horseshoe okay. Trail goes mm -hmm. from Valley Forge to Hershey, so it's an extensive trail. 
and we have a variety of other trails and a new trail map. So if you're a hiker, come to the visitor center, we'll give you a map, we'll show you where you're at, and we'll send you on your way. On your way. Okay. Besides so hiking though, bird watching of course is very popular. Sure. And in addition to that, uh, fishing, mm -hmm. and the biking on our tour roads is fun. Now hold on, I, mm -hmm. fishing is summertime fishing and ice fishing oh, we yeah. have here. We okay. are, we are a popular ice fishing destination, okay. especially this winter. We had plenty of ice. Sure. Um, so w there's also areas where we do have controlled hunts that are in the Middle Creek property that's done by a drawing. Hunters get an application when they get their regulations book, when they purchase their license, they can fill that out, send it to us, and we have a drawing, it's a public drawing. And I announce the name, so oh. if I call your name, it means you've been picked that day. <laughs> okay. And you can bring three of your fellow hunters with you and hunt geese out of one of our blinds. Oh my goodness. And it's, it's, we have a controlled hunt. It's one bird per hunter per day, and they're limited to how much ammunition they can take into the blind. We're okay. trying to keep this, you know. Sure. Uh, um, be able to share the wealth, share the resource a little bit with other hunters as well. But we also have Game Lands 46, which is right next to the Middle Creek property. That is like any other Game Lands. It was bought and paid for by hunters with $100, and it's an opportunity. You can hike there, of course, and you can bird watch there, but that is an area where there are going to be hunters. So all these things going on, which are mm -hmm. wonderful for public use, mm -hmm. um, is there fees for it? We don't charge any fees for our educational programs, for any of our programs here. As a state agency, um, basically the, the, the word I try and communicate is that uh, the Game Commission is unique in that we're self-funded. We're funded by the sale of hunting licenses. Right. So a lot of visitors say, hey, this was really neat. My tax dollars built this. No, it didn't. Right. Okay, but it is a resource that we want to share. The Game Commission wants to share with everybody. Well, and I love that. When I grew up with my uh, children and I was a stay-at-home mom for years, I was always looking for things that were free to do. And right. this is wonderful for families to it be is. able to get out and do. And who takes care of these lands? I mean, I know you're here, but right. how many employees are here and what are the rules or regulations that okay. go on with here? Okay, well, let me first talk, talk on land use, okay? In the area around the visitor center, this is a public recreation area. So it's designated for you to come out here with your family. You know, if you wanna play catch or go for a hike or something like that, mm -hmm. that's what it's here for. We have other areas that are called controlled area and they're posted, entries by permit only. That's either our volunteers that are doing maybe bluebird boxes, or it's the hunters that have been drawn for a goose hunt. Okay, they're so there are volunteers that oh, come yeah. out and help. Okay. Yep. And if, if you're interested in volunteers, stop in the visitor center. We, we have a master list. We'll give you an application you know, and see if we can push you to work. Great. And then we also have a propagation area. And just as the name suggests, that's for wildlife only. We very rarely go in there. And I think it's one of the reasons that Middle Creek is such a mecca for wildlife, because we have large parts of the area that they're not going to be disturbed. And if you think about it, there's not many properties like that in Pennsylvania. No, there's not. That's right. Then the other part you asked me about was... Uh, employees. Employees. We have a land manager who's in charge. Okay, he's an officer. And then we have the education specialist, me. Right. And we have an individual who works our front desk, our front counter. And we also have a food and cover crew. All game lands have a crew assigned to it, and they're the guys that do the work where the metal meets the road. Okay. okay whether it's um, boundary cutting, or we use controlled burns and prescribed fire to manage our meadows. I actually just got an email on that, and that's a whole nother issue that, that is. I'd love to talk about. Maybe we can talk that about that is. in our next location, but yeah, sure. that's incredible. Yeah, we use so. that very effectively to help um, improve our meadow habitat. And so what it does is it removes a lot of the non-native plants and a lot of that woody plants that we're trying to stay away from. And it makes that habitat that much better for those meadow species. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So we have a, a crew here, an educator, the land manager, the officer in charge, and a desk attendant. And how many volunteers do you think? I don't know. We got a lot. <laughs> um, a lot of our volunteers, they're here to maintain bluebird boxes. So they're assigned specific boxes. And they go around, they check it every week, make sure that everything's going as, as it should be, and hopefully we get a good year of bluebirds. We usually do. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, here we are at the perfect time when all the mm -hmm. snow geese are here. But I want to tell your, your visitors, this year, any year, once the birds are here, the best time to see them is going to be at daybreak or at dusk. Mm -hmm. At daybreak, the snow geese are leaving to go feed. And that could be in a 25-mile radius around us, and then when it starts getting dark, they come back to the lake to roost for the night. Okay. okay. And the other thing is, when we'll get in the field, I'll show you the difference. There's two species people are really here to see this time of year. Snow geese, and that's when we can see as many as 110,000 or more, and the tundra swan. And we have still about 2,000 tundra swans here. 
So those are the two species people are really here to see, but there's really a wide variety of duck species here, which if you don't know your ducks or if you're a new birder, you can pick up a lot of uh, species for your life list. Just stop at the visitor center. We'll tell you what's hot, where to go, how to access it. Don't forget your binoculars. All right. Thank you, Mr. Myers, for talking with us here, uh, giving us a background. Sure. And now I'd love to go out and see some of the beautiful species of birds. Well, it's so my they'll pleasure. Take us out. Okay, so now we're out here, and this area is called Willow Point. Yep. So behind us are some of the tundra swans. That's correct? right. Yep. The tundra swans is probably a, the most amazing of all the migration routes of the birds we see here this time of year, because unlike most waterfowl species, they migrate across the entire continent of the United States and they nest their breeding grounds in the Northwest Territories of Canada onto the front range of Alaska. So they fly across every flyway in the North American continent. Pretty amazing. That is amazing. Yep. So they go head back up to Canada then mm -hmm. to? The Northwest Territories, that's their breeding grounds. So All they right. have a, a short window, and this is true of the snow geese too. They've got to get up to their northern breeding grounds, lay their eggs, nest, incubate the eggs, hatch them, and then the young have to grow enough that they can fly back. So it's that's why they're, they're they're pushing north. We're late this year, and they're trying to get north so they can have time to, you know, raise their young and get them on uh, on, on the migration route when they have to head south again. And these are the ones that can live 20 plus years. Yeah, waterfowl can be um, long lived. Okay. And so uh, some waterfowl, you know, they can live into their 20s. Now that's not the norm, but it is possible. So do they follow the same route? Are these the same birds that are perhaps they been here for do. the last? They do. Find the, generally follow, follow the same route annually, okay? And so a lot of these birds that I've seen in the past, okay, are the same birds I'll see next year. And you know that because, are you well, tagging some of these? Some of these? some of these are banded, some of the birds okay. are banded, so we get we get the the, uh, the bounce backs, you know, we get the reports back from the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service telling us when they were banded and when we observed them here. Okay, and the sound they make is beautiful. Yeah, that's, the swans had that almost a cooing type noise. and the big thing for visitors is that the tundra swans are big and they weigh up to 18 pounds and they're all white and they have a black beak and black legs. The okay. snow geese are significantly smaller, six to 10 pounds. They have black wing tips, a white body and a pinkish orangish beak and feet. And we get more of the snow geese here. We do. And, and right lesser now, amounts we've of the already on swans. the downside of our peak. We have about 16,500 um, snow geese here and about 2,000 tundra swans. Okay, and what other species do we get here? Well, I think that people miss out on the variety of duck species that we see during the migration period. If you're a birder and you're trying to get those pintails or gadwalls or wood ducks, they're here, okay? They're migrating through as well. And then one of the real treats to look for this time of year, hunting our fields, is one of our state listed species, the short-eared owl. And they don't nest necessarily in uh, Pennsylvania, but they do pass through here during migration periods and hunt our fields. And they're generally the most diurnal of our owls. That means they can be seen during the day. So I've seen out. I've seen them at two o'clock in the afternoon before. I've seen them at 10 o'clock in the afternoon. So at Middle Creek, you're keeping your eyes open in the fields for the short-eared owls. And then their, their day counterpart would be the Northern Harry or the Marsh Hawk. And we see them during the day as well. Okay. And while we're out here, I see a lot of not only bird watchers with right. their binoculars, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of cameras out here. Oh, yeah. Are there a lot of artists that come here? We do and... get some artists here. Um, a lot of um, photo bugs, you know, they okay. come out here and they have their lenses and stuff. Hi, we have a real mixture. You have the serious bird watchers, the more casual wildlife watchers, and then you have the people that just, you know, they love the, the you know, pull the shutter on, on taking pictures. Or me, just come and just love taking a walk in yeah, the outdoors. It's a great, day, gorgeous. great place to walk. It really yeah. is. And the Willow Point Trail where you want to go. It's it's flat, it's paved, it's easy access. So. Yeah, because when we came out, also it's handicap accessible, it which is really important it for is. people to know. So you are welcome yep, and, and you can certainly uh, maneuver. Uh -huh, absolutely. That's why we had the, the trail paved a couple years ago. That's great. It's yeah. great. So tell me, is there any unusual stories? I'm sure you have to have some from all your years of being well, here. Well, you or... asked me, do I have a good story? And I had to ask you about wildlife or about people? They could be but either we'll go, or we'll both. Go with one that was pretty funny. I was working late and I was leaving the visitor center. We had 100,000 snow geese here. And there's this man out in the parking lot. He looks stunned, dazed. I go, sir, can I help you? And he goes, I have never seen so many seagulls in my entire oh. life. 
<laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, we're Close. talking snow geese. Close. And he's like, snow geese? I'm like, yeah, those are snow geese. Oh so my goodness. The other thing that's really, uh, Will Point can be conducive for is eagle watching. We have a okay. pair of adult bald eagles here. They're nesting here. They're incubating their eggs right now. So we should have a hatch here in about two weeks or so. How many How many do they normally have? I know we have the photo cam up right. from the Game Commission or the one out in York. Well, hope, I think there's two three. eggs there. You hope yeah. for three, you hope okay. For three. Two's the norm, could be one. Okay. We're not sure yet. They're in a new nest site that's a little hard to access for us to actually see what's going on. But we know they're nesting and Willow Point can be a good place to see our eagles, especially before the leaves green out. You know, with, without the leaves, you can see a lot better. So that's something else you want to be looking for at Willow Point or bald eagles. Okay, let me ask you real quick sure. too on that note with the tundra swans. How many do they? How many eggs do they normally nest at a time? I think generally they lay three, four. Three or four also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if Middle Creek wasn't here, where would all these where oh, where would all these birds that's go? It's a, a that's stopover. A, that's a good question. Um, Middle Creek's been become a very important stop, not only for tundra swans but for snow geese as well. Now we know that there are snow geese that are using the Lehigh Valley. So that would probably up the population in that area. Uh, as far as the tundra swans, maybe the Susquehanna River, there's parts of the river like Washington Borough and near Marietta that they've historically used, but they use Middle Creek much more frequently and in bigger numbers than either of those locations. And when they stop, it's, it's like two weeks, you think, roughly, that well, they're here? It, it they're always feeding varies. and just kind of and, resting? And some birds are, as they're arriving, others are departing for their breeding grounds. So it's not like every tundra swan comes here and then they leave the same day. It's very fluid. But we already are on downside of migration. Here we are, what, March 23rd, mm -hmm. and these birds are going to be out of here probably They're by the end of the week. Yeah, they really need to get north. Okay, and let, now let's go back to our volunteers. You talked mm -hmm. about volunteers, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned that they work on the blue... Uh, bluebird boxes, the yeah. The bluebird boxes. Uh -huh. Can you just go a little bit more detail for that? Well, you, to do a bluebird um, box program correctly, you need to have volunteers that are willing to check the boxes every week. So from spring to the end of summer, they're keeping an eye on these boxes, looking at the progress of the bluebird nest they have, reporting if they have a failure, reporting if maybe a predator gets into the, uh, into the box. I was going to say, what but would cause a we failure? It. So that it could be predation. Um, we have, you'll see wire over the front of our boxes that makes them look kind of unique, but that is a predator guard that's designed to keep raccoons out of the box. But uh, the other thing is you have, can have issues with non-native songbirds like the European starling or the English house sparrow and you can identify species by what the nest looks like. So if we had the wrong species in there, we're going to tear that nest out and hopefully facilitate bluebirds using that box. So they don't go up close to the nest, do they? Like what, what is their job as a volunteer? Like you know, uh, keep an eye on them. They just sort of open up the side of the box. Oh, they are. Okay, so they're physically look, touching. And they'll see in and... there and they'll count how many young they have and then close it. And then they can re-nest. Sometimes our bluebirds will, will nest, have three different um, uh, sets of young in, in a summer. Oh, my goodness. So we keep an eye on that to facilitate the bluebird reproduction. So if you want to be hands-on, that's a great way to do yeah, it as a volunteer. If you're a bird or just into the to wildlife, you know, come up to Middle Creek, fill out a volunteer application. We've had them do other stuff, too. Some of them, they'll do trail maintenance and you know, make sure we've got the hiking trails in order for visitors so they can go stretch their legs. Yeah, and, and again, just to repeat real briefly, but you said there's from a novice trail to, oh, to serious it, hiking from, trails here. If you've got here. little teeny kids, three, four years old, we got a good trail for them, the Spice Bush Trail. If you're a serious hiker, you can hike from Valley Forge through Middle Creek and end up in Hershey on the Horseshoe Trail. Shoo! That's not going to take you more than a day. More than a day. Yeah, it's going to take you a little <laughs> bit of time. Oh, that's nice. All right, so what else would you want people to know about here? I mean, we're... Well, Middle Creek isn't just a visit in March, okay? It doesn't matter what time That's of year. Important. There mm -hmm. is something going on here, wildlife, bird-related. For example, uh, in the summer, we see all kinds of egrets and herons, songbirds. In the spring in May, the bobolinks arrive, and they're a beautiful songbird. They have a gold cap, black body with white primaries, and you'll see them in our meadows. They're really neat birds. Eastern meadow larks, this is a great place to see them because we have that extensive meadow habitat that these species require. So we want to encourage people to come a all year anytime. round. Anytime. We're open year round. The only days the visitor center is closed is on Mondays. We're open Tuesday to Saturday, 8 to 4, Sunday 12 to 5, and then in deepest, darkest winter from the end of Thanksgiving to February 1st, we're closed. Then you close down. Yeah, then, so. then the visitor center is closed. But that doesn't mean you can't oh, come okay. out here and hike. If you want to come out here and hike the trails, it doesn't matter what time of year, what month it is, they're going to be open. Except for Willow Point. That, that sometimes is restricted because snow or it might be hunting season. 
So we know that Middle Creek is run by the Game Commission, mm -hmm. but the Game Commission isn't just here. That's just correct. in the 37th district. It's right. of course statewide. Can mm -hmm. you give us uh, just some details on what all they provide for the uh, citizens of Pennsylvania? I can. Um, the Pennsylvania Game Commission is our state wildlife agency. So our responsibility is to manage and protect the wild birds and mammals and their habitats for today and future Pennsylvanians. And I think Middle Creek is a perfect example of what we're able to accomplish in terms of wildlife if given the necessary resources, including the land, to do that. Um, throughout the state, we own the state game land system and maintain it. That's one point, almost 1.5 million acres of open land that's accessible to all Pennsylvanians. And what makes the Game Commission properties unique and it benefits all of society is that it's the hunters of Pennsylvania that bought that land. It was their dollars from purchasing a hunting license that allows us to go out and buy the game land system or to be able to put the resources into Middle Creek, whether it's new exhibits or it's habitat work or partnering with, with conservation organizations to further improve our habitat projects here. So the Game Commission, a lot of people associate us with you know, just hunting season, like a wildlife conservation officer, the game warden, okay? But we have biologists, educators, foresters, food and cover crew, and of course we have our administration in Harrisburg and our regional office. So we're truly a statewide agency that has uh, uh, lands in every county, except for I guess Philadelphia County doesn't have any game lands, nor Pittsburgh, but the rest of the state, they're all managed by the Game Commission for wildlife for the benefit of all Pennsylvanians. Well, it's important, and I tell you, I'm fortunate enough to be able to sit on the Game and Fish uh, Committee up okay. in Harrisburg. So a lot of legislation yep. comes before me. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in the 37th district, I have a lot of hunter and fishermen. Yes, and, you do. And just a lot of people who love nature. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever hesitate to reach out and, and make sure I know how they're feeling about different issues that come before us in the House. It's important. It is important. And I think in the end, you probably find that the um, legitimate sportsmen, the hunters, and those people that are interested in wildlife that are maybe a wildlife enthusiast, they actually share much, much many of the same goals and they have many of the same uh, belief traits that are you know, supportive of wildlife and the state wildlife agency, the Game Commission. So all the things that we talked about here today are found on your website and mm -hmm. what's your website? www.pgc.pa.gov. So okay. it's real simple. Just Google Pennsylvania Game Commission, it'll come up and the Middle Creek page on there, during the migration period, we put up uh, an updated number of what we're seeing. I saw so that. I love it. You can see that before Every you come three here. Every three days, yep. you know how as many birds As much as we can, we know how many birds are here. So we talked about all the estimates of the birds here. So I just want to know. I mean, I'm out there. Do I count one, two, three, four, five, no. or how do you do it? When you have 110,000 snow geese here, you don't go out and go one, two, three. <laughs> We've been trained to use the field of view of our binoculars. So I'll use that as my standard. I'll say, okay, if I'm looking at 2,000 birds here in this field of view, then that's 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, et cetera. So we're estimating. But at times, we're able to get our biologists in the air and they'll do a flyover, count from above. When they land, we, we check numbers and we're close. Are you close? Yep. And you're after doing your a job, while, right? <laughs> yeah, after a while, I think you get, a, you get an idea what you're looking at. Okay, so rule of thumb, we're, we're pretty accurate, but you can check those figures on the web page during the migration period so you know when the time is to come up. Come on up. Okay. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time with us today. Thank what you very a beautiful much. day yep. uh, here at uh, Middle Creek. So, and showing our viewers just what's here. So, hopefully, we'll get them out here. I, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you very you much. Bet. Thanks for taking yep. the time. And that's all the time we have for today. Again, I'm Mindy Fee. Uh, if you have any questions on any state-related issues, please don't hesitate to call my office in Mannheim or the uh, office in Denver, and we'll talk to you real soon.